your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition with Jeanette Roche. Hello and thanks for joining us. Fresh off the heels of the municipal election is a strong message from Albertans that equalization needs to be reformed. How this will impact things moving forward remains to be seen. Premier Jason Kenney says equalization needs a better formula to give us more of a fair deal. He says he was satisfied with the results of the recent referendum, which shows the majority of Albertans want to see a change. I understand that based on the current preliminary results, it's about uh, uh, around 60% having voted yes. But uh, we do want to wait until all of the votes are counted before commenting further. Uh, if we do see uh, that uh, endorsement of the referendum, we would then move forward with a motion in the legislature when it resumes later this month uh, to ratify uh, this request for a constitutional amendment. And then, of course, move forward with Ottawa on those negotiations. The Alberta government says a $3.5 million public inquiry into anti-Alberta energy campaigns confirmed the hundreds of millions of foreign dollars were used to block our province's oil and gas development. Alberta Energy Minister Sonia Savage says the goal of these groups was to landlock Alberta's oil and gas sector with a specific focus on stopping all oil sands development. During my 13 years experience working in the energy sector, I personally saw the evidence of these campaigns as they targeted pipelines like Northern Gateway Pipeline, Line 9, Energy East, KXL, and Trans Mountain. I could see the antics and tactics of these campaigns on the ground. I could see these campaigns as they stacked regulatory proceedings, organized grassroots activities, litigated when things didn't go their way, targeted policymakers, discredited regulators, and even chain themselves to infrastructure. What the public inquiry report does is to document with a significant level of detail who was involved and what their motives were. The organizations involved in these campaigns celebrated their successes as each pipeline project was delayed or canceled. While they boasted, Albertans were hurt Savage says many of these anti-energy groups supported their attacks on Alberta's energy sector by using funding and grants from multi-billion dollar foreign foundations. Savage says that money was used not only to target pipelines and projects, but to influence domestic public policy and legislation. Alberta's forestry and agriculture minister says the Trudeau Liberals will be hurting our farmers by proposing a 30% fertilization reduction program. Devin Drechen says Alberta's farmers could potentially lose out on up to $48 billion. Minister Drechen joined Hell Roberts to explain the impact this will have on our ag agricultural community. Farmers are getting increasingly worried, obviously with the federal election results being the way that they are, that this might be imposed on them sooner than they think. And something that, yes, as you mentioned, $48 billion income loss was the newest report that just came out. And with a trade exposed industry, which agriculture is, and massive amounts of exports that go around the world to feed families around the world, a 30% reduction in fertilizer not only hurts our farmers' income and their competitiveness, but also their ability to feed people around the world. And we're seeing that with inflation here in Canada going up. So again, this is just going to make it more expensive for Canadians even to buy food. So is the province looking at potential legal action against Ottawa, sticking up for our producers? Depending how Ottawa implements this, we are looking at all the different types of legal options that we have as a province to be able to implement this. We're working with, with our farmers and, and ranchers to see you know, what they would like to see and, and also other provinces that view this as a, a huge blow or could be a huge blow to our egg sector. So at this point, do we know when this could potentially be implemented by the federal government? We haven't heard any firm dates by the, the federal government. They are saying that they're going to announce a new cabinet come, I believe, next week. So we're obviously working behind the scenes to see exactly where this is, working with industry to make sure that any type of, of fertilizer reduction just does not happen because our argument is an ever-increasing carbon tax that the federal government has implemented through, if you buy their, their logic, through market forces should be reducing emissions. So to hit agriculture with a 30% reduction target in their emissions, also having a carbon tax seems like a double hit to our egg sector. 
really, because they are so trade exposed, would really hurt our, our, our economy across the province and the, and the country. Thank you so much, Minister. That was Alberta Forestry and Agriculture Minister Devin Drieschen. Coming up, we speak with an Alberta restaurant owner who's caused a lot of controversy for breaking COVID restrictions and holding rallies. He's even been fined $20,000. That's next, but first, a quick break. Welcome back. Well, some of you have likely heard about the Whistle Stop Cafe and Truck Stop in Mirror, Alberta, after Alberta Health Services and RCMP closed it down for violating COVID restrictions. The owner of the cafe, Christopher Scott, was recently fined $20,000 for violating a court order by holding an anti-shutdown rally in May. Chris joined me earlier this week to share his side of the story. It was a matter of survival at first. So we knew there was something fishy going on. We knew uh, that what was happening to other our business and other businesses and the, the you know the, the population in general wasn't right. And uh, we just made a decision to exercise some civil disobedience in order to maybe make the government pay attention to, hey, you know, there's those of us out there that we don't agree with what you're doing, and uh, we're we're not going to let you trample on our our charter rights. Regarding the fine that you received for $20,000 for violating a court order by holding an anti-shutdown rally back in May. So the judge in this case was going to sentence you to 21 days in jail, but instead he didn't want to give you martyr status. Instead, he fined you the 20 grand. So is something like this going to stop you from speaking your mind? It doesn't sound like it. There's a huge group of like-minded people. So I don't know if you saw yesterday, but we, we launched our organization, WS Full Steam Ahead. And it's basically a group of like-minded individuals that want to push back against this in an organized manner so we can actually make some real change. Um, in the couple of weeks before our, our uh, formal launch, um, we, we gathered 500 and some odd members. Uh, last night, we got another, I think, 1,500 members. So already, there's 2,000 people within this organization that are going to do whatever they can, offer to volunteer, do research, um, help lobby, whatever they can do uh, in, in order to push back against us. So a $20,000 fine uh, plus $10,000 in costs, um, I'm, it, it doesn't even cross my mind. Like, I'm not concerned about that. We're appealing that, of course. Um, and it's very ironic that Justice Germain, he said he didn't, he didn't want to make me or, or the Pulowskis martyrs but instead he did something that kind of martyred us more we have a compelled speech part of our sentence what kind of government or judicial system gives you a compelled speech sentence like nobody is going to tell me what to say or what not to say so that would be that the judge has ordered you to verbally share a disclaimer every time you express your opinions publicly, right? They're basically asking me to say, uh, what I'm going to tell you isn't right according to the government. That's what they want me to say. So, I mean, essentially the judge is compelling you to say something that you don't believe in, that you don't believe to be true. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer, but that order seems to contravene your charter rights to freely speak your mind. They're not really telling me I have to say that vaccines work or this vaccine works. They're telling me that I have to say the government believes that this is the only way out of this. They're, 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 they're making me speak on behalf of the government. So what happens if you don't voice that disclaimer? Can, you, can they put you in jail? I think so. Uh, I think if I breach any of the sentence, uh, the, the sentencing things, they could probably put me in jail because I'm on probation for 18 months. So if I don't act like a good little subject and toe the line, then yeah, I guess they could put me in jail. So there are many who say that you're reckless, that you're endangering public safety by staying open and not requiring customers to follow COVID restrictions. So how do you respond to that? There's a difference between being reckless and doing something that you know is going to cause harm. Justice Germain, he compared me to a drunk driver. Now, statistically, driving drunk 
there is a high probability that you're going to injure yourself or another person. Um, there's no question to that. And we have laws to prevent impaired driving, and, and, and we, we shouldn't have a problem with that. What we should have a problem with is when the government says, um, you have to shut down your life or your business, uh, effectively destroying your livelihood, because there's a slim chance somebody may choose to come to your establishment of their own free will and possibly get sick. That's a completely different thing. Thank you so much for being with us today, Chris. Appreciate your thoughts there. No, you're welcome. After the break, we discuss a Calgary City Councillor who's defying calls to step down over outrage from his admitted sexual contact with a teenage girl. Stay with us. Calgary City Councillor Sean Chu says that he will not resign despite calls for him to step down. Last Monday, Chu was re-elected as the city's Ward 4 councillor, winning by 52 votes in the province's civic election. He's been urged to step down after information came to light that he admitted to a sexual encounter with a 16-year-old girl while serving as a Calgary police officer back in 1997. Prior to Chu's Thursday press conference, the only media he spoke to was Western Standard. I caught up with Western Standard editor Dave Naylor earlier this week to chat about it. Dave, what can you tell us about the situation concerning him? This one's interesting. What happened was in 1997, he was a serving police officer. Uh, law, you know, very complicated story, but he ends up going home with what was then a 16-year-old girl, where he said uh, he admits there was kissing and hugging and, and consensual foreplay uh, before the girl said, nah, that's enough, I want to go home. Uh, he drove her home. Uh, she then filed a complaint of sexual assault against you. Uh, that led to seven years, believe it or not, seven years of investigations, court appearances, uh, things being overturned, files being sealed. Uh, the bottom line out of it, out of all those, uh, all those seven years of investigations, was that Chu got a letter of reprimand uh, that went on his file for... Uh, when he, he was dressed in uniform when he first met this girl and he caressed her leg at the at the establishment. So that was the only thing he got into trouble for. Uh, the woman uh, has alleged a police cover-up. Uh, the police chief uh, came out yesterday and said he'd reviewed the files and was satisfied it was a completely thorough and unbiased investigation with the uh, Crown prosecutors in Edmonton being brought in and they decided no charges were to be laid. So all this stuff came out late last week, just days before the election, an election which Chu won by 52 votes. Right. Uh, so there's screams for a recall. The Calgary mayor, Gondek, wants Chu gone. Uh, Jason Kenney, the premier, wants Chu gone. All of his fellow councillors want Chu gone. Unfortunately, there's nothing they can do about it. Unless somebody's been convicted of a criminal act, they cannot be removed uh, from their from their elected position. Uh, Chu told me he's got no intention of resigning. Uh, he said the truth will prevail. He's always told the truth. Uh, but, you know, obviously his family is suffering through this. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you mentioned that they, these all this all came out late last week, just before the election. Um, people went to the ballot boxes and they casted their vote. And it almost seems like the people have spoken. They voted him back into council, but it's everybody else <laughs> who wants him out. One of the key things here is the advanced polls. Yeah. Right? We don't know whether Chu got huge support in the advanced polls before these numbers came out. Yes. After these numbers came out, he may have got zero support, yes. but it was the advance polls that pushed him over the top mm -hmm. by that whopping 52 votes. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is it really is hard to say. Um, again, it's it, there's no way that they can remove him right now unless he wants to go. Yeah, exactly. Should be interesting to see what happens for sure. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about the referendums that were on the ballots. We actually won't have official results until next week. But uh, you're here. Are you hearing anything about the results of these two questions? Well, we've uh, the Western Standard have projected it will uh, pass with a 60% plus 
uh, majority vote. Uh, unfortunately, the city of Edmonton decided not to release their referendum uh, results, you know, spoil sports. So they're not going to be officially released until October 26. Mm -hmm. But uh, all the, the, the uh, ballots that have been revealed show that it, it, it will pass fairly easy. In Calgary, it was 58%, uh, uh, if I remember. Uh, some other uh, smaller cities, it was up as high as 69%. So, you know, when you've got Edmonton, who may support it by a bit of a, a lesser margin, but then you've got the rural areas who will no doubt be uh, largely in, in support of uh, removing equalization. So it will pass comfortably. It will pass in the, in the mid-60s. So, Dave, now what about the uh, Alberta senators in this last election? In, the, in this province, we elect our senators and submit the results, but the feds will still make their choice. So what's your take on what will happen from the results of this election? Well, it looks like the three conservative candidates are going to make up, uh, make up the slate. Uh, their support is uh, well ahead of uh, everybody else's. Uh, so they will submit their names to... Uh, uh, to Ottawa. Wait to hear if uh, Justin Trudeau is going to uh, to appoint them. Keep it right here. We'll have more after the break. Alberta's United Conservative Party government has been facing much criticism and also legal challenges for over a year now when it announced it was rescinding the province's long-standing coal policy brought in under former Premier Peter Lougheed in 1976. Well, since then, landowners, environmental groups, municipalities, and First Nations groups have been in protest to this proposed policy change, and they've got some Alberta celebrities on their side fighting along with them. I spoke with one of them, Juna Award in Canadian Country music award winner, Cora Blund. Take a look. Now, you're an Alberta boy, grew up in Tabor. You have a ranch near Mountain View. Much of your music is about ranching and agriculture. But tell me how you first got involved in being opposed to the Alberta government's plans to open pit coal mining in the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. So how did this come about? You've been very outspoken about it. I heard about the rescinding of the 1976 Peter Lougheed era coal policy earlier this year in the spring. And, and contrary to the narrative that the government's putting out, it wasn't a bunch of urban left-wing people who told me about it. It was ranching families, like friends of the friends of friends that, that ranch up along the 22, Highway 22. And their places are gonna get obliterated by this if, if, they, if they let the mining go forward. So that's one of the key things about this, this movement against the coal mines is it cuts across political uh, affiliation and it cuts across urban, rural, First Nations communities. We all, this isn't good for anybody. Yeah. Now, Corb, this week you re-released your song, This Is My Prairie, and some are calling it an anthem against the proposed coal development in the Alberta Rockies. So you've collaborated with other well-known country artists as well, like Brett Kissel, Terry Clark, Paul Brandt, and a few others on this project. So tell me, how did this come about? Did someone approach you about this, or was it your idea? That was my idea, yeah. I wrote the song years ago because my mom's always been active trying to protect the Rockies. And the, when I wrote the song 10 or 12 years ago, I was kind of inspired by that, but it was just kind of a fictional story. But then when this coal stuff happened, and my band recorded the, the track and I sang on it, and then we sent it out to, to Terry and Brett and uh, Armand Duck Chief, he's a kind of guy to listen to us on this because because the, the only people benefiting from this are, are foreign coal companies and possibly the government and a handful of, of jobs in mining towns. And I have sympathy for the people in mining towns, but you know, you know, Crow's Nest Pass people who are pro coal have been going after me pretty hard. And you know, it's very selfish in my opinion because we're hearing about a few hundred jobs per mine, but there's a hundred thousand people in Lethbridge who drink directly out of the Old Man River, and that's our water, and we don't want to contaminate it. It's an especially big issue, I think, for people here in Lethbridge. I live in Lethbridge. We're directly downstream from the on the Old Man. That's where that's where the selenium is going to end up. Yeah. Do you think that your involvement in this has maybe brought a little bit more attention to the forefront? Fooled them again. It's every step of the way. It's just been, has been smoke and mirrors and, and, and BS. And, you know, I'm not partisan. I don't care what party is doing it. I don't like any of the, I don't like politics, period. But I would say the same no matter who is trying to pull this stuff. But it's smoke and mirrors and it's deception and it's not, it's not cool. 
coming up, we feature some of the top local stories from around Southern Alberta. Keep it right here. The biggest thing is to sit down with the councillors and, and find out what, what you know, goals and, and uh, ideas that they have. This has got to be a team effort. You know, we, we talk about and throughout the campaign that, gosh, playing, there was some division here previously. We're going to have varying, uh, varying uh, opinions. The Lethbridge Symphony Orchestra performed their first concert in almost two years. Micah Quinn explains that supporters of the symphony enjoyed the performance this past Monday evening at the Southminster United Church. Glenn Clausen took over the directorship of the Lethbridge Symphony Orchestra in 2003. He says he got the itch for conducting when he was finishing high school. On Monday night, he was once again conducting, and the orchestra played a show called Series 1 Striking Rhythms with Adam Mason. The last time the orchestra performed together in front of a live crowd was close to two years ago. The concert we're doing, Striking Rhythms, is actually the one that we were planning on doing, and it got cancelled like three or four days before the concert uh, was to, to uh, take place. So we are so excited that we are able to... Uh, you know, it's almost like deja vu. We're just we're just kind of leapfrogging over, skipping over the last 18, 19 months, and 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 here we are. So, feeling very fortunate that we've been able to uh, rehearse and uh, make music again. Klassen says the orchestra didn't perform online during their downtime, which would have required him to conduct. Uh, we as an organization certainly were not in a position to 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 have, first of all, the finances in place to do that, nor did we have the uh, expertise in-house to 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 deal with those kind of issues either. So the, the thing going, uh, um, uh, doing something online, we left that to some of the larger professional orchestras around the world to do that. You can visit the Lethbridge Symphony Orchestra's website to find out more information about the group and their upcoming shows. Thank you, Micah. The University of Lethbridge has released a new campus bird checklist as a way to get the community involved and explore local surroundings. Master's student Samantha Krauss helped with the initiative documenting over 135 different species of birds at various times on campus. Krauss says the project has been in the works for several months. Lethbridge has four seasons-ish and there are different birds in each season and even the same birds will look different in each season. So if you really want to see bright, beautiful, colorful variety, then go out in the spring. But I love chickadees and chickadees are here all year round and they're very friendly in the winter. So it's a good time to go birding any season in Lethbridge. Krauss says she's eager to grow the birding culture in the city. You can find the checklist by visiting the University of Lethbridge website. Well, four authors in our city have constructed a new picture book chronicling the history of Lethbridge. As Micah Quinn explains, this new initiative featuring hundreds of pictures took around a year to complete. Lethbridge, a history in pictures. There are more than 130 photographs encompassing the broad history of our city in the book entitled Lethbridge, a history in pictures. The book was co-authored by Lorian Johansson, Belinda Croson, George Cool, and Bobby Fox who are all members of the Lethbridge Historical Society. And we happen to have a lot of these pictures either through the museum archives or in our own archives, and it makes a great gift, so we thought we would put something together that told our story visually. This tells our story in a way that everybody can enjoy, right from very young children all the way up to, to people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s and beyond. So this is something for everyone, and we wanted to make sure that Lethbridge could tell its story uh, in a way that everyone can digest and enjoy. Before it was a popular place for a bite to eat, the Water Tower and Grill restaurant originally started as a water supply in the 1950s. Then it was decommissioned in 1999 and converted into the restaurant and bar that we know and love today. George Cool, one of the co-authors of the book, says it took about a year to complete. You know, the final draft was, um, was ready, I think, in June, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, basically the summer and early, early fall uh, gave them time to get the printing and, and distribution in order. You can purchase the Lethbridge A History and Pictures book at local bookstores and by visiting ilovebooks.ca.
And lastly, Monday's election saw longtime city councilor Blaine Higgin elected mayor of Lethbridge. It was a closely contested race against rival Bridget Mearns. He received close to 43 percent of the vote compared to Mearns at 41 percent. Higgin, who was a city councilor from 2013 to 2021, says he's excited for what comes next. The biggest thing is to sit down with the councillors and, and find out what, what you know, goals and, and uh, ideas that they have. This has got to be a team effort. You know, we, we talk about and throughout the campaign that, gosh, Blaine, there was some division here previously. We're going to have varying, uh, varying uh, opinions, but it's going to be something we need to work on our strengths and not our weaknesses. Let's get together and do what we can to better the community. That's what it's all about. If we had any issues, let's put them behind us. Let's wipe this slate clean, if you will, and let's get going forward. In the second half of our show, it's all about health. I speak with Monica Lowen, who holds workshops about building a healthy marriage, and a Lethbridge eye doctor gives us some great health advice about our peepers. Keep it right here.